Garden City. Available by saying play WHBC to your smart speaker. Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on nccradio.org. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. Guess what, my friends? Guess what? This program is repeated on Sunday evening at 11 p.m. So, hi there. My name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This, of course, depends on when you are listening or watching us. Gavalt, Gavalt, can you, you? I forgot to mention, you can actually see us on Facebook Live at WHBC or at my own page at facebook.com, Anshul Pearl, and you will have the opportunity to see me. I'm waving right now. My hand is going to the right and going to the left and all around. And so, hello on the radio, hello online, and hello to the world. So welcome to all of our listeners, all of our uh, watchers, so to speak, and uh, welcome today. And you are welcome to um, put a post up, say hello, make a comment, say good morning, whatever you like, my friends, this is the opportunity that you have. Today I'm going to... um, talk a little bit about some serious stuff and some outlooks and some principles that will help us appreciate life in many ways. And I do thank everybody for the comments and the uh, hellos that we received throughout the week. It really, uh, I really appreciate it. So the rabbi stands in front of his congregation and reports to them that there's a massive hole found in the roof of the synagogue. And the rabbi continues, I have good news and bad news for you. The good news is that we have the money to repair it. The bad news is that the money is in your pockets. See, as the old expression, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. I'm going to tell you about 12 guys, 12 Jews, 12 leaders who went on a mission and failed miserably. Out of the 12 Ten came back complete failures. Only two came back with success. I referred to you to the portion of Shalach, the Torah portion that was read in synagogues throughout the world this, this very weekend. It tells a story of 12 men who were dispatched by Moses from the desert to go to survey the land of Canaan, which later on, of course, became the Holy Land of Israel, to survey the inhabitants. The purpose of their journey was to prepare the Jewish people for the subsequent conquest and settlement of the land. Well, upon discharging the spies on their mission, Moses presented them with a list of questions that they needed to answer. He said, listen, you're going on this mission? See the land. How is it? Check out the nations that are dwelling there. Are they strong? Are they weak? Are they few? Are they uh, nu- numerous? And how is the land in which they dwell? The land itself. Take a look. Is it good? Is it bad? And how are the cities in which they dwell? Are they open or are they fortified? Interesting. And even today, my friends, there are people who think about, think, think about Israel, think about these things. So when the 12 spies returned from their 40-day tour of Israel, they presented to the people a report of their findings. What do they say? We arrived at the land that you sent us to, and indeed it flows with milk and honey. This is the fruit. They showed them the fruit. But the people that dwell in the lands are powerful. The cities are greatly fortified, and we also saw offsprings of the giants. We cannot ascend to to that people, for it is too strong for us, they proclaimed. Guess what? This report demoralized the Jewish people and drained, drained it from the motivation from entering the land. So as a result, the spies died and much of the generation died in the desert, never making it into the promised land. Only 39 years later, in the year 1276 BCE, did the children and the grandchildren of this generation cross the borders 
and settle in the promised land. So one of the many questions raised by the biblical commentators concerns the reason for the spies being condemned to punishment. Moses gave them a detailed list of the questions about the land. He instructed them to make their own observations as to what will await the people upon their arrival. And guess what? This is exactly what the spies did. They came back with an answer to all of Moses' questions and reported what they perceived to be the reality. So if Moses expected them to cover up their observations that the land was inhabited by mighty men and the cities were generally fortified, he should have never sent them in the first place. So why were the men faulted for relating what they had seen? Is this not a case of kill the messenger? The answer is that if the spies had merely related to Moses and to the people the reality of the situation as they saw it, everything would have been fine. But they did more than that. They used the difficulties they observed as an excuse to capitulate in the face of fear. Had the spies returned and said, Hey guys, we have seen a mighty people, a well-protected cities in the land, so now we need to devise an effective strategy about how to go about our challenge and mission. Guess what? They would have fulfilled their task flawlessly. The moment they responded to the obstacles by saying, we cannot do it anymore, they swayed an entire people to abandon their God-given destiny. So the spies are condemned for substituting the legitimate and important question, how will we do it, with a despairing and helpless conclusion that we can never do it. You see, each of us has a domain in our life that needs to be conquered, a terrain that needs to be transformed into a holy land. Some of us need to confront trauma, fear, insecurity, temptation, addiction, or shame. We must confront challenges within our psychic, our marriages, and our family. Since the challenges that lay in recovery's path are at at times frightening, guess what? We are naturally tempted to believe that we are incapable of overcoming our darkness. And guess what? We surrender to the obstacles. Now, guess what? The, the, The feeling is understandable. But if you surrender to it, Guess what? It will rob you of the opportunity to liberate your life and to arrive at your personal promised land. The option of resignation compels you to remain stuck in a barren desert made up of stuff, of shame and despair. The question ought not to be, can I do it? Because that's the question coming from my inner sense of incompetence. God conceived us in love, and the day we were born is the day that God declared that the world is incomplete without you. As the saying goes, sometimes when you find yourself in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you're actually being planted. The resources to repair the hole in the personal roof are present. I am empowered to leave my wilderness and discover my light my joy, and my wholeness. God has sent me into each of my journeys, my life's journeys, with the power to bring light into my darkness and to discover my own inner infinity. As a divine ambassador of love, of light, of healing, and of hope. So the story of the spies that we learn about is really our own personal story. My trauma tells me I can't. I have all the emotional evidence and data to support my conclusions. But with lots of empathy and faith in my inner divine self, I can discover a deeper, untarnished, unfearful core that has the power to say, I can and I will. Now let me figure out how. I want to dance to the beat of creativity and connection, not despair, 
to the beat of survival and loneliness. So the question is, ask not whether, but rather how. How to go about this. And with that, I say hello, good morning to all those on Facebook, to Jean, Jean Brandenston, to Miriam, to Linda, and to Lavana. Thank you so much. Lavana Lichter, thank you so much for joining us, and we wish you, Tzayschem L'Shalem, a bon voyage. Let's continue this, these thoughts. You know, it was a promising moment that turned disastrous, this discussion. Ten of the spies who Moses had sent to spy out the land came back with a report calculated to demoralize the nation. We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, they said, the people who dwell in there are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. We're unable to go up against the people, and on and on and on. The land through which we have gone to spy is out. It is a land that devours its inhabitants. And they concluded, we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. What did they mean, asked the Talmud, that the peoples in the Holy Land are mightier than he? Who is he? The Talmud explains that the spies were referring to God. Conquest of the Holy Land, said the spies, is beyond the capacity of the Almighty himself. As a result, God informs Moses that the generation that left Egypt would not fit to enter the land of Canaan. He decreed that the people should live out their lives as wanderers in the desert until a new generation could take up the challenge. So what really happened? At first glance, the story makes no sense. In all of history, one cannot encounter a generation whose lives were more saturated with divine miracles than Moses' generation. These ten spies and all of the Jews they were addressing had witnessed how Egypt, the most powerful nation on earth at the time, was devastated with ten supernatural plagues. They experienced how this mighty empire was forced to free them because the mighty hand of God had directly intervened for the only time in history to combat evil. Just a short while before this debacle, these ten men and all of their brethren saw how, when when Pharaoh's armies pursued them, the sea split to let them to let them pass, and then they, they were all drowned. All the Egyptians were drowned. In the desert, the Bible describes how miracles were stuff, was the stuff of their daily lives. Manna from heaven was their daily bread. Miriam's well, a miraculous stone, which traveled along with the Israelite camp, provided them with water. And clouds of glory sheltered them from the desert heat and cold. These were the people who, just a few moments earlier, months earlier, stood at the foot of Sinai and experienced for the first time and the last time in history how God revealed his presence to the entire nation. This generation was accustomed to God's miracles like New Yorkers are accustomed to parking tickets. For them, not to acknowledge the supernatural powers of God was a blatant Denial of reality. Yet these very same people declared, We cannot go up against these people, for they are mightier than he. God himself. Gavald, what's going on here? Imagine if you had turned to one of these ten spies as he was speaking of the impossibility of conquering the land and asked him the following question. Hey, what did you have this morning for breakfast? He would certainly have answered, it was manna. When you'd ask him, Dad, did you purchase this manna in the grocery store? He would look at you with astonishment and respond, a store? No way. We receive our daily food from heaven. Really? You persist. And how exactly did the food fall from heaven? The man would probably respond, 
Listen, young man, let me present you with Religion 101. God created the world. He owns nature. He knows how to make food fall from heaven, and that's if, that's if he wishes to. Yet, this very same spy, who had just enjoyed breakfast from heaven's kitchen and had just quenched his thirst from a miracle well, could stand before the entire nation and declare without hesitation, Boys, hello, we've got no hope to take over the promised land. God himself can't help us either. If we're fighting him, we are dead. The entire nation not only was convinced, but began mourning over its hopeless fate. And this is a people that just over a year prior supernaturally crushed and defeated Egypt, the world's superpower. What is more? You know, the Torah clearly states that the spies were no ordinary individuals. They were all men of distinction, leaders of the children of Israel. So what happened, baby? What happened to them? What on earth happened to them? There's one more important question. When the two faithful spies, Joshua and Caleb, challenged the conclusion of the other ten spies, they used these words. Stand by, everybody. If God desires us, he will bring us to this land and give it to us. But do not rebel against God. This is what they said. Fear not the people of, of the land. God is with us. Do not fear them. Why did they not make their point infinitely stronger by substituting their message of hope and faith with a message of facts and reality? Why did they not tell everybody else there? Don't you remember how we left Egypt? Have you forgotten how we crossed over the Sea of Reeds? Don't you recall what you ate for breakfast this morning? I felt. Good morning, Gina Marie. Don't you see the clouds encircling you? You see, the first generation of Jewish people who left Egypt lived in a transcendental oasis, encompassed by heavenly clouds, nourished by, with food from heaven, learning divine wisdom from Moses, the greatest teacher of all times, and witnessing miracles on a daily basis, transformed their lives into a veritable paradise on earth. What would be their situation in the land? You know what would happen? They would have to fight wars, plow the land, plant the seeds, gather harvests, create and sustain an army, an economy, and a welfare system. They would have to do whatever, what every other nation does, live in a real world of empirical space. What then would happen to their relationship with God? Yes, he would still be present in the rain that made the crops grow in the blessings of the fields and the towns, and in the temple in Jerusalem that would, they would visit three times a year, but not visibly, intimately, miraculously, as he was in the desert. This is what the spies feared. Their underlying problem with the land, as the spies expressly, you know, in a, such a dramatic way, was that it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. What were they saying? The stress of physical life and running a country will destroy our spiritual creativity and numb our souls. So now we can well understand the spies' argument that we cannot go up against these people, for they are mightier than we. Notwithstanding all the experiences they, they, they had, had encountered, we cannot have it both ways, argued these spies. Either we are a spiritual people engaged exclusively in spiritual pursuits, and sustained by supernatural means, or else we have to enter the natural world of the farmer, the merchant, the soldier, and, s and become subject to its laws. The spies argued that if God wishes for us to live a spiritual life, then certainly he can sustain us with the miracles as he has done in the past. But if, we, if his desire is that we abandon our supra natural existence, to enter the land and assume a life inside of the constraints of nature, that he himself essentially has decreed 
that natural law will govern our fate. In that case, they argued, he cannot empower us to miraculously conquer the land since we uh, they, they, they would defeat that would defeat the whole entire purpose of entering the land. Nature dictates that we will not be able to defeat the 31 mini empires that dominated the land at that time. So guess what? The spies concluded they are mightier than, than he. Even God cannot help us if he himself has chosen to transform us from the celestial nomads into a materially structured nation. The confusion of the spies is at the heart of a struggle confronting the Jewish psychic for close to 4,000 years to this very day. Who are we and what is our role in this world? Should we, we be insular or integrated? Should we be parochial or universal? Ought we live in our own orbit or are we part of the family of nations? Are we this people or just a just another normal ethnic tribe. So who is the Jew? A fragment of eternity or just a contemporary people? This can also be a personal question. We enjoy the pleasures of money, of food, of fame, of sport, of leisure, of music, of art, of literacy and knowledge as anybody else. Yet, when we define ourselves purely in physical terms, we basically experience an illogical emptiness. Even if we convince ourselves that we are part and parcel of the ordinary society, the world around us reminds us there is something different about us. One cannot begin to answer the question of Jewish identity if one is not comfortable with the notion of paradox which, as we know today, defines the core of our universe today. The first generation of Israelites who left Egypt could understand the Jew as a creature of heaven or as a creature of earth. He is either living in a space of miracles or in the real world governed by a hardcore nature. But the objective of Judaism is to serve as a link that interlaces heaven and earth. The Jew, each of us, have cho were chosen to become a bridge, to be an example of a bridge between the spiritual and the mundane, between the soul and the body, and between God and all the material things that we have. Our role is to become that rope, so to speak, that links the holy to the unholy, that transforms the unholy into a holy. Heaven is not our destination, and guess what? Earth is not our prison. We are here to reveal the un undefined unity that integrates everything in this world. So the entire role that we all have is to imbue our plowing, our sowing, our commerce with a holy and godly purpose, to create a land that is holy, to make the ordinary extraordinary. In Judaism, the conflict between religion, sciences, you know, is superficial. Science, the laws of nature, are also divine. All of the cosmos is a mirror of divine unity. This was the message of Joshua and Caleb, the two faithful spies who believed that they could be a triumph and be successful in their attempt to settle the land. They could not discuss the miraculous past of the people, for the spies were exploring the natural future of the same people. So what Joshua and Caleb said was, if God desires us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. But do not rebel against Hashem. Fear not the people of the land. God is with us, do not fear. In other words, Though God desires from us to become part of the natural world while employing natural means for survival, we must always remember that if we follow Hashem's course, then guess what? 
Hashem will allow the supernatural light to flow through the, the natural channels of politics, of economics, of military prowess. You know, one of my favorite anecdotes is about the little boy who wanted $100 so badly that he prayed for two weeks, but nothing happened. He decided to write a letter to Hashem, to God, requesting $100. When the postal authorities received a letter addressed to Lord USA, they decided to send it to the President of the United States of America. Well, the President was so impressed, touched, and amused that he instructed his secretary to send the little boy a $5 bill. The President uh, thought this would appear to be a lot of money to a little boy. The little boy was delighted with the $5 and sat down to write a thank you note to Hashem, which read, Dear Lord, thank you very much for sending me the money. It's just a pity that you had to send it through Washington, D.C. And as usual, those morons deducted $95. Oh, boy. The boy got it right. Go got it right there. In the studio, everybody's like laughing all over the, all over the studio. The boy got it right. The money comes, the money comes through Washington. Uh, it comes through Washington, not from Washington. We recall certain events of the past. Let me now say hello to Peter Hershorn. Always good to hear you and see you, Karen Dombeck. Thank you, everybody, joining us today. And I'm going to talk about a um, recalling recalling an, an interesting episode as it developed in the Talmud. It has an interesting perspective in our life as well. And it really boils down to the responsibilities that we all have. We all have. We talk about the spies and how disastrous it was. We all have a, we all have a piece of this world to uh, enhance and to transform into a, a land of uh, milk and honey, into a holiness. Every part of our life, what, whoever we are, we all have the ability... To have, we will have, a, so to speak, a, a corner in this world to elevate. So, from time to time, it's worthy of recalling certain events of the past in order to influence our thoughts and our actions today. And this is really why I bring up uh, the readings, the biblical readings of this particular week, because we read the stories and we understand it's part of Torah and is there to teach us something. So, when we look back, so... When we look back, we can also see better ahead as well. We become more informed, better guided, and better equipped. So one of the things that I bring to your attention today is the the, the idea of remembering. Remembering our past, connecting to the past, and how the impact it brings to us right now. I take you back where the world is filled with a flood. Noah's flood. And Noah is on the ark. I'm sure you know, everybody knows the story. And then suddenly the Torah tells us, God lovingly remembers Noah and all the animals that were with him in the ark as the flood destroyed all of the earth. We can understand the recalling of the covenant which God entered into with our founding fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob which also applies to all of us, their descendants. We can understand also the remembrance of our great events in the history of our people. This coming week on the American calendar is July 4th. Everybody pauses between the barbecue and remembers the freedom that we have in the United States. So we think back and appreciate the freedoms that we have here today. So our question is, we can understand, remember about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, remember our history, that's why I was sharing with you the stories with the spies. What's the significance about, you know, to us today, that uh, about Noah and the animals, that they too should be remembered by us today? Why would that be? I mean, there are many answers. That, one, I want to share with you how the Talmud fills in some interesting details into Noah's story that I feel has some special relevance to our generation. 
with which it would uh, be therefore wise for us to recall. And I think all of us uh, will admit that our generation is facing some rather interesting challenges on many, many levels. So let's see what, what the Talmud says about this story. And why is it part of our psyche, part of our study, part of our history, part of our affiliation, is to remember how God remembered Noah and the animals. During Noah's times, there existed, says the Talmud, it's called an agadita, an enormous creature called Re'im. It was a massive ox-like or buffalo-type beast with extremely large horns. If you think that the oxen and the buffalo we know today are already huge and heavy, they are nothing compared to the stories of this animal called the Re'im. This animal was so large that it could not possibly fit in the ark with Noah and the other animals. Yet it somehow survived the watery apocalypse. This is a story brought down in the Talmud and you'll see as it unfolds, but have in mind that this is sometimes more of an imagery than, than, than in a reality, but an imagery that for us to learn something. So you th- think, of the, think of the ark, all the animals, Noah was there with his family, and there's this very, very large animal. How is this animal going to get into the ark? Can it get into the ark? How can it survive? So how, the sages asked, could this outsized Re'im manage to survive the flood? Keep in mind, my friends, that today as well, in a certain sense, the world is also filled with a flood. A flood of craziness. And how are we to survive in an environment like this? Sometimes we're outsizing ourselves, so to speak. Like this challenge as presented in the Talmud, this huge animal, how could it survive? How did it make it through? So the Talmud presents an interesting discussion of what they did with this large, huge animal that had a problem getting into the, into the, uh, into the ark. Think of these things as I share it with you today as in our life as well. We're, tr- we're trying to save ourselves. We're trying to remain calm and to move forward and to see peace in this world. And sometimes it's very hard to incorporate the ideas. How, how can we handle this? So the Talmud initially suggests that Noah brought this a young Re'im into the ark, a younger one, and that since this remarkable creature had yet to reach its full size, it was able to fit inside. So one of the answers given is, it sounds plausible, you think, right? Uh, so you're asking about this, this particular species? It took a baby one, a smaller one. But that theory is promptly rejected by the Talmud on the grounds that even a small one, an infant Re'im, the, like a little baby, baby, this baby species was already greater than the dimensions and the mass that any other beast was too large to have been accommodated within the ark because they were born big, lumbering and massively muscular. So the Talmud goes on to explain a different hypothesis. And how did they save this animal? Reish hichnisoy leteva. This theory is that the Re'im remained outside of the ark during the flood but managed to survive by keeping just its head inside, while the stocky body stayed outside as the waters rose. <laughs> I, I, you're going to come to the same conclusion as the Talmud. The Talmud says, ha, you know, good morning, Jonathan Wolf. The sages, however, reject that answer, noting that the Rayim's head and horns were by themselves so massive, they could not have possibly have fit inside. So they knocked down that idea that maybe... The animal survived by just sticking his head in horns. Impossible, because his head and horns were also far too big to fit inside the ark. 
Thinking up another alternative, alternative explanation, the Talmud goes on to posit that which means that Noah let the tip of the ram's nose into the ark, leaving the rest of his gigantic body paddling alongside, submerged in the swirling waters. As usual, the, the, the sages rebut this answer too, stating that if, that if even the nose was in the ark, the vessel could not have been sealed airtight, and the ark would have surely sunk to a watery grave. Wow. So finally, what does the, the Talmud conclude on this theoretical uh, called Agadita? That Noah, how did, he, how did he save this animal? He strapped this animal onto the deck of the ark. And that is how the mighty beast survived. This is no doubt a fantastic story. But what is the Talmud really telling us? And how does it uh, relate to us in our world today? In the Talmud, the Ark symbolically represents the, uh, the whole of tradition that has carried us on the longest voyage in human history. So think of the Ark as described in the Torah as this oasis where just as the ark went through the roughest of seas and saved the family, each and every one of us must find their own ark, an ark where we can voyage through Jewish history, face all the roughest of seas and the most enormous and unexpected adversities that we, that we face at every possible moment. It's not just a boat, but how we spiritually stay afloat. And the ark of our spiritual heritage has preserved our people through many seemingly non-survivable, insurmountable stormy oceans of history that have too frequently threatened to engulf us. So think about this. And I... I challenge everybody listening today of where, so to speak, each of us fit in. There are those who are born in an ark, who come from traditional homes, receive a good Jewish education from the very beginning, and um, giving the, the person a buoyancy that others may not have. Just like the young Ra'im, the suggestion that it was a small Ra'im, they grew up sheltered and protected by the ark of their, of their traditions, of their Judaism. Thus, they never, uh, that's all they know of. They grew up in the ark. They were able to get into the ark, so to speak. They, from the beginning of their life, they lived with this protective value system, like the ark, the protected the humans and the animals, all the way back then. But sadly, in the world that we live today, there are many who are born outside of the ark. Due to different circumstances, various pressures over the last centuries, many simply do not have the privilege of having been born inside of this. Yet, what, what did the Talmud suggest? One way of keeping connected was to stick your head, right? Take that animal and stick its head into the ark. That's how it was initially presented. What does that mean on a deeper level? That you can have a person whose mind and intellect is such that it brings them back to the ark. Their mindset, their approach to life, is like they use their heads. They have intellectually understood the richness and the depth of, of life. And they've understood the ark is where they belong. But not everybody is intellectually inclined that way. It's, it's, uh, not everybody has that ability or thought process to make it happen that way. They tell a story about a group of secular Israeli university students who were passionately arguing over whether it was worthwhile reading the Hebrew Bible. Perhaps it was just a collection of ancient fairy tales. 
After an hour of arguing, one guy blurts out, Look, guys, I'm not religious, but I know one thing. When the Jews came out of the desert after 40 years, they had five books that changed the world forever. Our friends, the Bedouins, have been in the desert for 4,000 years. They haven't even produced one single pamphlet. Your ancestors copyrighted and published the all-time bestseller in the language that you still speak. Read the book. Okay. So you have a person who eventually, who is intellectually uh, inclined, will use his head to come to appreciate, you know, where he or she belongs in the arc of this protection. But then, what about those who don't read books? who are not so intellectually inclined. Nevertheless, what did the Talmud say? We have another way of possibly uh, managing this animal or our personalities. They, they, they're intuitive. What do we suggest? That one way of saving this animal was they allowed him to stick his nose. Sometimes we all have an intuitive sense that brings us back to our, to our roots, to our ark. Emotionally, we pick up the scent of Judaism by experiencing the draw towards faith. This, they felt this deep in their hearts. So think of this whole story of how to save this particular animal in the different formats, as the Talmud suggests, of different approaches of how to stay afloat in the world around us. You have those who were born inside the ark their whole life, their whole environment, their experience from childhood brings them in the ark. Automatically, they're there. You have others who, who eventually they use their minds, their heads, so to speak, to get into the ark, to stay afloat. Then you have those who don't even have that, but they have their nose in it, so to speak. They have a tu- intuitiveness. They tell a story of Levi Yitzhak of Vaditshiva. Once suddenly... Uh, held up the services on Yom Kippur, stopping everyone in their tracks. Seeing how everybody was puzzled, he explained, there's a, there's a young shepherd boy who was orphaned at an early age and never learned how to read Hebrew. On this morning, he saw everybody walk into the synagogue and he asked why, where's everybody going? He was told that today was the solemn day of Yom Kippur. And he felt very bad that he could not join in, in, with everybody in prayer. And since he could not join them, the young boy went out to the field and began reciting the alphabet on his own, repeating this prayer, the only prayer that he knew several times. A man passing by heard the boy's voice, each time getting louder, and he peeked through the bushes. He saw a young boy, eyes closed, repeating the alphabet to nothing but the grasses and the sky. So he interrupted him. He said, what are you doing, young man? And the boy said, I am praying, sir. The man seemed surprised, and so he he asked further, but why are you just reciting the alphabet? You do not, you you do know, uh, that's not a prayer. You're just saying letters. The boy explained, yes. I don't know any prayer, sir, but I'm told that today is Yom Kippur, and I want God to take care of me and of everybody. So I thought, if I said the alphabet, the ABC in Hebrew anyway, then God would put the letters together into words and he would know exactly what I wanted and what exactly what I wanted, what I should be saying. And Rabbi Rabbi Levi Yitzhak smiled and he said, the boy is right, right, he's right, and right now he's reciting the alphabet and God is busy putting the letters together to form the most powerful of prayers. Therefore, we must delay our prayers until the boy is finished. We don't want to interrupt his words that are shaking up the heavens. Before his alphabetical prayer, we should all stand in awe and attention. So bring you back to our conversation. Many don't know how even to read prayers. But guess what? They may not have the mind, the mindset, the intellectual side. May not have been grown up in the ark, so to speak, growing up with all the traditions. But the heart is on fire. It's on fire for God and lights the way back to the ark of the heritage. Then, my friends, 
as the story goes on in the Talmud, there is a majority of people that we all must think about and feel responsible for. We need to think about all those who are neither fortunate enough to have been born in the ark, nor to have been led there by their own intellect. They even lack a heartfelt connection to their faith, which is hardly surprising. They're simply not familiar with it, due, due to no fault of their own. They are swimming, often drowning, so to speak, in this sea of indifference. Forget about the ark. They need a lifeboat. So how, is, how should we respond? My friends, this is key. This is key to so much of what is needed in the world today. We must reach out with friendship and help the person into the ark with love, looking after them and ensuring their safety and security in the storms, just the same as those who were born in the ark. We are all, we all have the ability to bring our fellow on board, no matter how far they may have drifted spiritually. There's always space on board. We just need to invite them in and be sure that they know how to come aboard the vessel. I'll tell you, years back, some leaders of the Jewish Federation shared an idea with the Lubavitcher Rebbe for a campaign that they had come up with. It was before Passover, and they wanted to put out a call to world Jewry to do something special to honor the memory of the six million. The idea was that every Jewish family that would sit down to the Seder should add a chair, an empty chair, to remember the one and a half million children who would have been saying the Manishtana but would not be there because of the Nazis. In their honor, let every Jewish family add one empty chair was the message being given out. Guess what? The Rebbe refused to go along with this campaign. I'm sorry, he said. I cannot endorse this campaign. They asked, why not? It did not seem to, uh, to make any uh, sense to them why he would refuse. And the Rebbe answered, if you want to come out with a campaign to memorialize the six million, why are you promoting the addition of an empty chair. Improve that campaign. Yes, let every Jewish family add a chair to their Seder table, but let them fill that chair with another person who would otherwise not be participating at the Seder. You want to remember the six million? They would not have been empty chairs, would they? They would have been there, actively participating at the Seder. So go and call to the Seder a person who has been out of touch with his or her tradition and invite them with love into your home. Fill those chairs with hundreds, with thousands of millions of young men and men, anyone, men and women, everybody. That, the Rebbe said, is a campaign that I can get behind. Indeed, there is enough emptiness in this world. What we need are more people around the table, not fewer. What we need is bringing together the welcoming of more people, more who feel alienated from their faith. What we need is to fill all the chairs we have at hand. Perhaps so many chairs that we wonder how will we ever fit them in all of our rooms. Each of us have a role to play in strengthening life life in general, Jewish life in particular, and the scale with which it, this, this uh, you know, how we do it is, is, is not important. If we succeed in making a positive difference to just one other person, if we fill one chair with one more person who would otherwise would have not have been in the Seder table, that is sufficient. One life, says the sages, is like a universe. Therefore, if you change one life, you begin to change the world. All you need is the willingness to share your Judaism. For example, on Shabbat or the festivals, invite a guest into your home. 
It bothers me to no end. People have beautiful homes. And it could be years. They've never had anybody else except themselves in the house. Never had a guest. Never had an interaction. Nobody's ever come to them. So what's going on? So invite guests into your home. Once a week, learn with people who know less than you. Every one of us can be a captain, so to speak. We're all responsible for the ship, for how full it is, for where the ship is ultimately steered to. For many, this sounds difficult. You should know that I know that too. I recognize and accept that. Shabbat, holidays, guests, Torah study. You're thinking, hey, Rabbi, it's very nice. And yes, I don't want to let anybody drown, but frankly, I wasn't raised that way. I was not born in an ark. I'm no sea captain. Who am I to help others? There's only one answer I can give you. It's a very Jewish one. You are wrong. Yes, you can be a captain. You are a captain already. Let me explain. I'll take you back to 1940. The British army teetered on the brink of disaster. If they fell, all of Europe would as well. The Nazi Blitzkrieg had decimated Europe and nearly conquered the entire continent. The Third Reich was unstoppable at the peak of its power, and England's French, Dutch, and Belgian allies had collapsed. A quarter of a million British soldiers who survived retreated to the beaches of Dunkirk, and now their backs were to the sea. Here they were rendered even more vulnerable more at risk than ever before. Exhausted, they had hemmed themselves into a very dangerous position. They were trapped and desperate. The Nazis were closing in by every second that went by, and even the great British military, famed for achieving the impossible, could not get them out. They were on the brink of annihilation, and what was worse, it was the very core of the British army. If they lost this fight then the British would have been defenseless and lost the war to Germany. In that moment, you can imagine how every, everything seemed hopeless. It was the end of the line. Civilization last stand, right there on that day, down to the water's edge. What would they do? How did they turn the war around and ultimately withstand this Nazi offensive? The story is nothing less than most remarkable uh, of uh, evacuation of modern times. A call went out to all the English civilians who had private fishing boats, lifeboats, dinghies, and yachts, rafts, anything that could float, that could steer a a course across the sea. Go across the channel to rescue our soldiers, they were urged. All hands were on deck, literally, to make sure no soldier was left behind. The response was remarkable. Hundreds, literally hundreds, of untrained sailors, fishermen, yachtsmen, civilian Pleasure uh, craft captains and merchant ships responded to the call. They dropped whatever they were doing at home, at work, for themselves to go and respond. They did not stall, did not waver. The solution was staring them in the face. They were an army in themselves, and their time to serve had just arrived. The Royal Navy, assisted by hundreds of untrained fishermen and private civilians, succeeded in ferrying a quarter of a million British soldiers to safety. Churchill described it as the miracle of Dunkirk. Those, these evacuated troops would form the basis of a rebuilt British army and its effort to win the war five years later. The very nucleus of the fighting force that stopped barbarism. I feel that something similar has happened in the world today. After the Holocaust, the Jewish world was decimated. The Rebbe called out to his students, to his community, to anyone who would listen. Your brothers and sisters are trapped. They are disaffiliating. It won't last long, but they're still there, standing, just waiting to be brought back to their identity, to the rich chores of our tradition. We need to go out and rescue them. This is an emergency. The future depends on it. You don't need to be a professional or a scholar or a powerful All we need is to cross the channel of indifference using whatever vessel we already have. Use whatever talent or capacity you've got 
and do your best with it. If you have a fishing boat, use your fishing boat. If you have a yacht, then use the blessings of wealth. If you have a kayak or a uh, paddle, uh, or paddle hard, and hard on your kayak for your brother. Don't stay at home in the comfort of your own community when you know someone else is out there drowning, calling for your help. If you can save one person, who knows how many more you will be saving. Then how many each of those will in turn save? By assisting one person, maybe you saved a thousand or more from drowning. This is the call of the time. Shem is calling out to us, to each and every one of us. Heed those calls. They are meant for you just the same as they meant for me and for my friend and for my neighbor. You can be assured that even if you flicker, you know, if a moment goes by, say to yourself, should I try to do something? This is what God is saying, waiting for you to reach out and make that difference in such a special way. Today, um, there are thousands of young men and women across the world, every corner of the globe, who have dedicated their lives to make sure to help and to create a wonderful community. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you a wonderful day, a good week, a happy July 4th as we continue into the summer times. Please remember, everybody, reach out there and make a difference.